Dead. Well, the United Nations High Commissioner of Human Rights in Uganda, this is a department of the United Nations Secretariat, and the mandate is to promote as well as protect the enjoyment and full realization by all people for all rights established in the Charter of the United Nations and in international human rights laws as well as treaties. Now, this comes just months after the ending of the DGF operation, something, of course, that has also been debatable to date, and this morning we adjourn joined by Dr. Sarah Birete to let us know uh, what this actually means, the interpretation of these two countries such as Uganda with all the violations that we've been singing about time memorial. Good morning to you. Good morning, Priscilla, and uh, good morning, viewers. Okay, so your opening remarks in regards to what has transpired in the last few days regarding this office, are we safe? I don't think so. I, you know, and, and maybe I want to start from the duty, the duty of governments globally. Governments have an international obligation to protect universal human rights. Universal human rights are clearly laid down in the, in the instruments of, of, of UN, as well as the Universal Declaration on Human Rights adopted in 1948. That uh, instrument has been signed ratified and domesticated by Uganda government in our chapter four of the constitution. So when you go away from the international, we have the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. We have uh, human, uh, human rights instruments at East African community, as well as other regional organizations that Uganda is a member of. Okay. So when you have a duty of government to protect the fundamental rights and freedoms of the people, it's important for Ugandans to know that even the rights contained in our constitution are not enjoyed in this country, like freedom of assembly, association and expression, and Article 29 of the constitution. We have gone ahead to enact instruments like the Uganda Human, no, the Human Rights Enforcement Act of 2019, which emphasizes the duty or the function of duty bearers in protecting and defending the rights of citizens. With all that, we have witnessed a growing trend of abuse of human rights, growing trends of torture, growing trends of kidnaps, growing trends of trial of civilians in, in military courts, even after two courts, two rulings of the Constitutional Court, declaring it unconstitutional. Almost on a daily basis, you have civilians mm -hmm. charged in the military court martial, and we have detentions without trial, prolonged detentions, where 60% of people on remand spend more time in prison than the sentence they would have served if they were guilty. So you have all these challenges as a country, and we have been undergoing as a country the second session of peer review in terms of observance of human rights before the UN Human Rights Council. All these elements were before the Human Rights debate, the Council for Debate. The Attorney General in December tried to defend themselves. People were not convinced. The recommendations of state parties are clear on the need to improve the human rights situation in Uganda. So when you go from that background and read the letter of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, it underscores two elements, strong national institutions that are able to protect human rights and do the mandate of the UN Human Rights Office in Uganda mm. and vibrant civil society. Let me start with strong national institutions. Most of these institutions merely exist on paper. Because if you go under the justice law and order sector, you have the institutions of police, you have courts, you have other mechanisms for arbitration in society. Do they exist? Do they function? Police is still ranked the number one corrupt institution in this country. It's closely followed by judiciary. So what are these strong national institutions? One can argue that we have the Uganda Human Rights Commission. For the last two years, we didn't have a chairperson for the Uganda Human Rights Commission. The current chair, who has spent one year 
even had was not fully constituted and they've just held their first tribunal sitting, which is still ongoing. But also government has cut their budget in the next budget framework paper. Government has cut the budget of the Ugandan Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. So what commitment is there for this government, even to argue that we have vibrant national institutions? When it comes to civil society, civil society have been ongoing, you know, continuous on slaughter by government. Since 2011, 42 NGO offices were broken into with no single report, even where offices have CCTV camera. Police has never produced any single report. If you look at the environment, we have, we comply, we have seven, eight entities to comply to on a yearly basis. So let me pause it right there. Um, we are joined by Stephen Bide, who is on ground. He's with the Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, State Minister. And we want to find out from him, maybe what's the interpretation of strong institutions? What's the interpretation of a vibrant civil society vis-a-vis uh, -vis what you have submitted to us? Good morning to you, Stephen Bide. You tell me that. Yes, going to you, Priscilla Regina. You know, there is, oh, the, there was a German pastor and philosopher called Martin Nimora. He said that first they came for the socialists. I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the Jews. I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist, unionist until they came for me, and there wasn't anyone to speak for me. And this is why I'm here to speak to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, State for International Relations, Ladit Henry Okeroliem. Good morning to you. Good morning, Bide. It was nice being here. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, you're making the space for the civil society, government partners, uh, everyone. You're making it shrink, shrink day by day because you make international partners, you make international friends, and then all of a sudden you say, we are closing the doors. Why are you doing this to your friends, international partners? No, um, everything has to be put in perspective. Mm. And the facts have to be researched as to originally why we signed an uh, agreement and welcomed them to Uganda. All these international organizations are talking about, we do not invite them to Uganda to stay here permanently and pensionable. No. They came, we signed with them specific agreements for this particular purpose, and when that purpose and objective is finished, then there's no need for them to be around. And if you read the uh, agreements, finished? if you read the agreements that we have signed with them, they're specific to the word, and they know, that they know it themselves. The, 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 the reason why they, they were here, the objective why they're here, they know it very well. But when times are going home, because they're a bit comfortable in Uganda, they don't want to leave. Times come, times change, and situations change. They are situa the situations that are happening, we know there are still st stories of uh, good images of uh, people being tortured, people being ab abducted. We know these stories, and you know these stories. These, are also, these, are st these stories touch on the human rights But, the, but these, these are, they are not uh, as enormous, uh, not big cases, or not escalating cases, or not continuous cases or not repetitive, repetitive cases. These are, these are the, uh, you know, cases here and there, and, and uh, the world over. Uh, there are cases here and there in any country in the world on human rights. It's not as if it's something that happens every day. It's of such a, a huge uh, uh, case, a situation, that uh, is, is so alarming, that is stopping government from working, that is the government is being uh, bashed left and right to the international community. No. You know, the word out there, and you know it that uh, the people are saying because these people are receiving, receiving, receiving petitions from people who are claiming to be tortured, who are claiming to be abducted. People it is normal. Whose it is normal in, in normal older mm. countries. Even because they're opening let the me doors. Tell you, even in the United Kingdom, these countries which you people like so much, and America, which you think is the most democratic country in the world, okay? There are more murders of young black people in, um, in the United States. By, mm. by the state policemen. By the police, and these cases are reported to human rights organizations on a daily basis. So it is normal anywhere in, the, in this country. It is not specific to Uganda. All countries have human rights organizations, which uh, you uh, individuals petition to, 
and then then then, then, then those cases are, are come out in, in in public. So what is happening here is well, nothing unusual. What you're trying to insinuate is that because so and so uh, so and so is eating a frog, you go for a fatter one. I thought you would say as as government of Uganda that yes they are. Are helping to create capacity building for our local NGOs here. I think, I think, you I think, I think you're, you're talking here about the Office of United Nations Human Rights. I think that's what they're talking about. Yes. That's what they're talking about. Who are building capacity Listen, for local NGOs. They signed an agreement with us in 2000. I hope you know the history. 2006, 2017 mm, years. No, no. Two, they came in 2005. We signed an agreement with them that they will be here up to 2000. And then by 2019, Okay, their mandate had, had, had been exhausted. And you it. Mm. And they came here specifically to build capacity, to, ad, ad, to give advisory services, to in, improve on, on human rights po and policies with human rights, particularly the Human Rights Commission and other MDAs and other NGOs. Now, but in this particular case, mm. they came specifically to open offices in northern Uganda, in Gulu and in Moroto. Listen, specifically, we invited them specifically to open offices where? In Moroto and in Gulu. Now, when the war in northern Uganda finished, and they were supposed to bond the human rights uh, situation in, in northern Uganda, the war in Uganda was finished. And uh, the, what we had signed with them as a host country agreement had been exhausted. And we think that they, we had discussed also with the Uganda Human Rights Commission, Commission listen, mm. that are they satisfied with the capacity building that received from this organization? They said yes. So. The capacity you're talking about, we know that Uganda Human Rights Commission, even today, doesn't have the capacity mm. to run sessions. Right now, it is seated with over 1,000 1, cases, complaints of human rights abuses. They cannot even sit and, see and hear these complaints. The, 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 the issue is financial, listen. The and issue is not capacity. If you're talking about capacity, they're, well, they're, they're up to capacity. We this had discussion with the president just uh, last week. And this ex the president assured us that the, the financial capacity of the Uganda Human Rights Commission will be improved. So, it's, and we had a meeting with the chairperson of the Uganda Human Rights Commission in, my, in the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the issue that came on and on and on was about money, about financing, and not about the capacity building. You know, they, it seems that they uh, assured us that they are satisfied with the position they have reached today, and uh, the issue is only about money. Is the government fearing these spaces, these people? Ah, because, ah, ah, let me tell you, fear for uh, what? the third, uh, the <laughs> fear there, for was, what? there was a, a third president of U.S., uh, Jeff, Thomas Jefferson, he said, uh. when governments fear the people, there is liberty. When people fear the government, there we is tyranny. No I'm telling you this because... We don't fear this institution, listen. We fear them, for what, what, what do we fear? They're doing capacity. What, 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 what is in Uganda is, is a secret in Uganda. Everything is, is open. In Uganda, we also have, uh, on a regular basis, go to uh, the Human Rights Council in, in Geneva. We face the Human Rights Council in Uganda in, in Geneva. We meet our peers and we on, on the Human Rights Review in Uganda, and we explain ourselves. You know, and, and, and each time we sc we, we score high. Th these people, when they opened doors for NUP leader and the team, together with the journalist that time, Bobby Wine, when he was going to petition the the office. You and your office, human rights office. You, as the state, release the military to go and beat up this, this, these people. That, that and also that the journalists. That That's that what that I'm that saying. That, 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 was that, that was a mistake of an individual officer. The chief of defense force at that time reprimanded those officers. Okay? And they were brought before a court martial. This is a mistake. The, 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 the state accepted it. And, and, and action were taken to correct that mistake. But there is this, the issue of the, of the Office of the United Nations of uh, Human Rights in Uganda is not about NUP, is not about the FDC, is not about CCP or, or NP2, whatever it is, it's not. It's, uh, it's, about, it's about that uh, the agreement signed with them in 2005 was for, for, listen, for them to deal with the issue of human rights in, in Gulu, uh, in northern Uganda, and, and, and in, 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 in Karamoja region. And well, once that, that was, was finished, we also accepted, by the way, to extend their term for another two years to give them op opportunity to, you know, to, to, to wind up. And they knew it very you well. Know, if, you really w if you as the state were really, would you really love these people uh -huh. and you really want to be successful? I'm talking about the UN office uh, after human rights. If we, you don't, really we don't love them. We work with uh, them. Okay. If you really wanted to continue working with them, uh, you would look at the mandate. That the mandate was talking about this, or maybe you know, then you're going to explain it. And then you look at, okay, how can we collaborate with you 
because we are international partners, we you help each other. How? Why didn't you look at the mandate and maybe say, we let's, we let's revise it? <laughs> but have you talked to them? Have you talked to them? Have you revised them? Listen, have you, have you talked to them? If you talked to them, they should have told you that in 2020, already they were given notice. In 2020, if you had talked to them, they had been given notice that the, their mandate will not be renewed in 2023. You listen, know listen, listen. Mm. In 2020, they knew. So why ruffle, uh, feathers are being ruffled, I don't understand. This is not all about the U UN Human Rights Office. We know that even up to now, Facebook is still closed, which is a, which is an, a, which is a platform for free speech. We know that DGF, which was supporting these NGOs to do their work, was also shown the exit. We know that also this more than 50 NGOs are no longer operating. The space for operating civil liberties anybody is being curtailed any, day by day. Anybody who does not abide by the rules the constitution, the laws of Uganda will pay the ultimate penalty with respect to who you are. Facebook is not immune to it, okay? Uh, Twitter is not immune to it, okay? NGOs are not immune to it, you are not immune to it. Anybody who breaches the law of this country, irrespective of who you are and sponsored by who, whoever it is, I can assure you the law will take this force. So, Facebook, there is nothing special about Facebook. When Facebook chose to do what it is, it paid the, co the consequences. Okay, when those NGOs chose not to abide by the rules in which they were registered with, they paid the consequences. So what, what, what's wrong about that? Are you telling us not to follow the rules? You know, the, the reason as why I began with that quote uh, uh, from Martin Nomola about who, when, when first they came for the socialists because no one was speaking for them, is the fact that it post elections, that's 2021, uh, you remember the riots that came around, uh, people who were killed in Wakiso and Kampala. This wasn't the first case of human rights abuse. You remember what happened in Kasese? You remember what these abductions? Remember the, the L5 chairperson? The, 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 the issue of, of, the, the issue of human rights. We will, we will, will be, will the issue of human rights will be here far beyond you and me and the world. These are individual mistakes that are made. Mm. They have to be investigated. And those who make those mistakes have the irrespective of who they are, even including me. Those who fault on the issue of human rights, irrespective of who they are, mm. have to be brought before the law. That's what is important. Where the government fails, is responsibility to bring those who uh, fail on the issue of human rights. That's where the problem arises. And yep. this government is determined, mm. and, and, and I can assure you, is determined and always determined that to respect the issue of human rights far and beyond the standards set by any, the international community. And therefore, those who fail to abide by the, by the rules and the laws respect of them on human rights will be penalized. And you know, yesterday I was and watching and the leader of opposition, Honorable Matthias Simpuga, and even now, I know Dr. Salabilet is in the studios of NTV. They have been talking about challenging this uh, move by government, that it was not in good faith. And they're saying that, at least Simpuga was saying that they're going to try and petition all forces that be to make sure that your government reverse this decision. That is a beauty. That is a beauty of freedom in Uganda. That is a beauty that you can go and petition. <laughs> the open leader opposition is free and go and petition, go to court and do it. That's the beauty of it. Sarah Beretti can talk freely and say what she wants. She can go and petition. That's the beauty of the freedom in this country. And we're very proud that we have brought that freedom to allow them to do what it is. If we, if we stop them from doing it, then you'll be here blaming us from uh, impeding what? Uh, freedom of, of expression. Mm -hmm. uh, we welcome the petition, we welcome them to talk, and we welcome you also to debate. I'll wait petition. for her re reaction to that, but uh, I can't leave before asking you about our Ugandans, fellow brothers and sisters who are in uh, Turkey. But, but, but before we go up there, mm -hmm. you see there's this misconception uh, of, of human rights that the government of Uganda does not, uh, has no qualms, uh, has no respect for human rights, and does not bother about, uh, it, it is in our constitution, it's in China, your constitution, it's your human rights, it's, it's in the constitution. We have put a, up a Uganda Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, and you many can't very make and listen, break. Listen. You are bre we, uh, making have, and breaking. Uh, we have so many, we have allowed so many NGOs uh, to, uh, who, who champion human rights, civil society who champion human rights. There are so many, mm. more than necessary. Mm. They are there out there. They can do more work than even, uh, and they've got more connections than this office, where, where, which, which is time has come to end. Th th that's the bottom line. Mm. We, as a government of Uganda, fully 
respects human rights, work towards improving our human rights situation, and under no circumstances will allow anybody who breaches human rights to get away with it, and they'll be brought for the law. Thank you, Honorable Henry Kedoliem. I know you have people as government of Uganda who are in Turkey. Uh, over 10,000 people have already died in Turkey due to that, that strong earthquake. I know even your friend, uh, no, he's not your friend, but Fred Rumbo is among the Ugand Ugandans who are in Turkey. You had promised to bring him on, uh, on the plane <laughs> back to Uganda. The safety of Ugandans, uh, have, you any, have you heard of any case yeah. of, of, of Uganda it dying is, in Turkey? Uh, first of all, it is, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, we send our sincere condolences and apologies and uh, sincere condolences and sympathies to the government of Turkey. We, do uh, we also send, send our condolences and sympathies to the government of Syria, who are also impacted, and the other neighboring countries, Israel and, and, uh, and others, for the damage and particularly the loss of life that has taken place. It is true that uh, we have had cases uh, and reports that have been come to our mission in, in Turkey that uh, they are, there were two Ugandan girls who are missing in a block of flats, which was shared by four girls. The two girls were in, in another apartment somewhere, two survived, but they cannot account for their two friends. So we, the, our embassy is monitoring and working with the Turkish authority to find out the whereabouts of those two girls. There is another gentleman, whom I don't have his name here now, who, uh, who was recovered from under rebels, a Ugandan, and uh, he's in the hospital now. Last night he was in very bad shape, but this morning I'm, I'm told that he is he's now in, in better shape. He has rang his parents and talked to his parents, and uh, he's hope, oh, hopefully he'll have a full recovery. Otherwise, we have sent out a message to the Ugand all the Ugandan communities, wherever they are in Turkey, that they should stay closer together. How many are we talking about? Monitor, we know? Uh, monitor each other. In Turkey, we have close to five to 6,000 Ugandans. And they have uh, group leaders and, and, and uh, team leaders. Mm. So we ask them to, to monitor and, and assist us by uh, following uh, and, and caring for each other and reporting such cases of those who are missing to the Uganda uh, Embassy in, in Turkey. Thank you so much, Ladit Henry Okero Oriem, Minister of Foreign Affairs, State for International Relations, and we hope that uh, what is happening with the UN Human Rights Office won't dent Uganda's in relationship no, to with the, to the, the contrary, world. To the contrary, uh, the Uganda government is determined to continue okay. working and investing mm -hmm. in human rights. Thank you so much. Now we go for a short commercial break, and the rest of the quiet programming continues. Prisa Regina Naroga and Chris again here on Morning at NTV. Keep it's still morning at NTV, and thank you so much, Stephen Bide, for giving us the ground picture with the Minister Orian there. Okay, uh, in regards to what actually is embedded in the arrangement that we have had with the Office of the UN Higher Commissioner for Human Rights here in Uganda, what was its mission that was properly uh, put in black and white and signed and sealed back in 2005 therefore them implementing their works here in Uganda in 2006 which he says was objectively related to you know recovery of the war victims correcting the wrongs that went uh, south uh, regarding human rights in the northern of Uganda and so they were given that mandate to actually promote human rights in the northern Uganda set up office in Moroto and Gulu to be able to deal with the human rights issues there. So maybe we're going to pick it up from there and ask ourselves, but also ask my, ask my guests, has that original mandate been fulfilled? Now, I am Priscilla Regina Naloga. We have been joined by Mr. Livingstone Sewanyana, who's executive director uh, for a very interesting office regarding human rights, foundation of human rights and initiative. Now, where you sit, you've been observing this, um, you know, pro not problem, but mm. issue that we are having right now with all the violation of human rights in Uganda. Let's first be objective to, to why this has come at such a time as this and ask the question, for the original mandate for which this office was set up in Uganda, has it been achieved, Dr. Livingston? Mm. Good morning, listeners. I think for all intents and purposes, the very objective for which this office was established has not yet been achieved. Whereas one can argue rather correctly that it was about recovery. 
considering the conflict that we experienced in northern Uganda, over time this mandate actually was broadened. It was broadened to the effect that this office, as an extension of the United Nations system, had a task of creating an enabling environment for human rights players, most particularly the Uganda Human Rights Commission and civil society, to build the capacity of those players in order to create a robust civil society sector that can uphold and promote human rights in Uganda. As we speak today, that has not been achieved. You cannot argue that the Uganda Human Rights Commission has been strengthened to, the, to, to achieve the objectives for which it was set. Neither can you say that we have a robust civil society. Actually, over the last five years, the civil society in Uganda has been weakened. It is at its weakest point, in fact, ever since the NRM came to power. At the same time, as you recall, for a long time, the Uganda Human Rights Commission was not duly constituted. It has just been duly constituted. And they are just trying to pick up the pieces. So one would expect that the mandate for this office is still justifiable. One, on the grounds that there is a need to strengthen the sector. There is a need to build the capacity. There is a need to extend technical assistance. There is a need for a coordinated approach with the UN system in order to uphold the, the, the objectives of the UN Charter. You know, states have primarily been obligated to ensure that within their jurisdiction, they do everything possible to uphold the rights of their citizens. And that includes attracting mechanisms such as the UN Office for Human Rights. So it is rather absurd, I would say, and untimely, on the other hand, for the Uganda government to make such a decision. It would be questionable as to its intent and whether it suits the very purpose for which it has been made. So you say entirely nothing has been achieved? would be your stance? There has been work that has been done. We need to agree. Yeah. There has been work. Mm -hmm. Actually, in Uganda today, we have quite a number of human rights organizations. We have the Uganda Human Rights Commission as a national institution. But the key issue here is capacity. The key issue here is the ability for them to hold the state accountable. And when that ability is still questionable, the non-existence of this office raises multiple questions. Birete, they can still hold the state accountable and the different you know, abuses of human rights in Uganda accountable. But what the, the ministry is simply saying is that they can do it while we submit to the very same office in Geneva or Switzerland. It's, according to them, it's pretty much one and the same because the primarily objective for the existence here is null and void, according to the contract that the minister has spoken about. And therefore, it's not that they're stopping their work here. They continue their work, however, the influence and interference of them directly here in Uganda is what has been cut off. I think what's clear is that the government of Uganda is running away from closer scrutiny on their human rights record. First of all, on you have a deteriorating human rights situation in the country, characterized by torture, kidnaps, the trial of civilians in military court martial, Doctor here and other human rights agencies were even in the African Union court over this matter. There are two decisions in our constitutional court. There is a decision of the Human Rights Commission, Africa Human Rights Commission, on trial of civilians in court martial. And the intention is clear to brutalize these people who are victims of martial law. So you have this increasing tendencies of gross abuse of human rights. How can you say that we are in a better situation than 2005, save for the war in northern Uganda? We are not. We are not a vibrant civil society. A 
everybody knows that government is looking in the camera and telling lies. No, I mean, wh I think where they, they come from to say that is that they have allowed the freedom of civil society to which, speak out on the different issues that they are standing for or against for that matter. Which freedom? Since 2011, 42 NGO organized offices have been broken into with no report, no arrest, even where offices have CCTV cameras. From the break-in, physical break-in in the office, we went into closure. 54 organizations closed without due process. Away from that, after closure, of, uh, you close NG, uh, DGF. DGF was supporting 80% of civil society work in Uganda. So you've closed support for 80% of civil society work. And as if that is not enough, in this very office that has been closed, in after elections, media, media which is another human rights watchdog, was beaten on the UN complex, compound. What was, that was an assault. And I think it was a message of what was coming to this office, which has finally happened, mm. the closure. Because how do you beat media for doing its work? That is the nature of deterioration of human rights in this country. Vibrant civil society? When we have, it during elections, you close, arrest election observers. Election observers have been declared human rights defenders by UN. Arrest election observers, declare biggest entities doing election work as terrorist organizations. Is that a vibrant civil society that we are talking about? Mm -hmm. I don't think it exists. And we are indeed, like Dr. Sewanyana said, we are in a worse situation ever in terms of human rights, in terms of civil society for the 37 years of Museveni's rule. Dr. Sewanyana, um, of course we have to respect the fact that we went into agreement and these agreements have to be honored. And the, if they have come to an end, they've come to an end. In terms of agreements, there's always room for revision. There's always room for rearranging the terms and conditions for an existence of such an office like uh, the Human Rights Higher Commissioner. Now, where we stand, it, it, their work really was done and dusted by the original contract between 2018 and 2019. They had a renewal of that contract. Uh, the purpose has been defended as to finish and close up everything that were hands on here in Uganda so that then they can prepare for the termination that has finally uh, fruit, uh, come to fruit. Now, in terms of diplomacy, what does it take to, what would it take to actually have this office reinstated back in Uganda? Well, Would course, we need uh, to have another set of problems presented to them and then it's uh, signed as a different arrangement for them to return? Of course, the establishment of this office is a creature of the negotiations between the UN Office for Human Rights in Geneva and the government of Uganda through our, our permanent mission in Geneva. It's normally a very protracted process. And as far as I know, even agreements in the past that have been renewed have had to go through quite a spell. There has always been a general reluctance by the government of Uganda to host this office. And I'm not surprised that when this came to pass, they have made this decision. It would require you know, the intervention of the UN Secretary General, it would require the intervention of the UN High Commissioner for them to consider uh, revisiting such a decision once it has been made and communicated. But I would imagine that if there are good grounds, yes, we appreciate they were, they were meant to complete the assignment and, and exit. Okay, even if that happened, are there good reasons, for example, for it to be, to continue its work? And as I have said earlier, that contrary to the argument that they present, that the business for this office has now been uh, accomplished, we believe very strongly that we still need to build a civil society 
that has a capacity to hold the state accountable. The National Human Rights Institution also needs to gain enough capacity. They need expertise. They need resources. They need technical assistance. That could be a basis for them to revisit the agreement. But all said and done, it is up to the government of Uganda to consider whether such a decision does not cast it in bad light to whether by making such a decision they are upholding the commitments under the UN Charter, three, whether they will be seen as a civilized member of the UN family. These are arguments that they, or considerations they have to make. But of course, at the end of the day, it's the decision of government. One, as a state which has the primary responsibility of upholding human rights mm. of, in the country, and one that actually enters into negotiations with fellow member states. So as the UN independent expert on promoting a democratic and equitable international order, I would make a case that issues of equity, issues of democracy, are still uh, rife on the, on, the, on, the, on the table. And there is need for the Uganda government to renegotiate this agreement. Of course, the final decision lies entirely in their hands. OK. So speaking of decision, is there a possibility of having a reversal of the state's decision on this matter? Uh, if, if I were to say there is a possibility, I would be very presumptive and speculative, because this is an interstate decision. And of course, once a decision has been made, as I have said, it may not be that easy to reverse it. The intervention to reverse of the it. It, okay. it has to be based on justifications. It has to be based on the government's, actually it's the government's willingness. You see, for an office of that nature, or a UN agency for that matter, to exist in a particular country, it requires the will of the state. If the state is not willing, you cannot impose it on them. So it all depends on the willingness of the state to host this particular agency. If they feel that the business is that has been conducted is done and there is no justification for their existence, it's still within their realm to, dis to, to make a decision. So it, it's basically up to the government of Uganda to rethink and reevaluate. And if they think the business is done, there's no need for this office, then of course, it is a fait accompli. Okay. Uh, back in February 2020, Sarah, you get to look at uh, the mandate of this office having further uh, broadened in terms of establishing a regional human rights training center that would be here in Uganda. Of course, this was to provide training for those that are in human rights activities and then also looking into the international rights system for government officials or members of the regional states that are interested in this nature of training. And then, of course, looking at empowering more the institutions and the civil society that um, is being left with this work to pick up the pieces. So at the end of the day, that element was precious to the future and empowerment of the Uganda Human Rights Commission and the civil society players that are holding the fort uh, for fighting for the rights of humans here in Uganda. But it's all gone by the wind. Where do we, where does this leave us? How is this going to affect the work that you are doing? You know, it's, uh, of course it leaves us on our own, <laughs> we are on our own, and the uh, citizens had better understand that very clearly, and they uh, uh, increase their vigilance to protect their rights. I think that over time, government has exhibited a deliberate intention to ignore rights of some people in this country, especially the political rights. The civil rights, of course, there, is, there has been consistent attacks on civil society and civic space. But when it comes to political actors, you see a deliberate intention to abuse the rights of some sectors of people in this country, especially members of the opposition. And it's important to note that the reports of the Huma, of Human Rights Commission are largely ignored. I don't remember any report that has been acted on. It's just to fulfill 
a, a, a constitutional obligation to lay reports on table. Nothing happens beyond that. So this is the situation we are talking about. Even if you empower Human Rights Commission, do you act on their reports? Do you even read them? I don't think so. And they are never debated even in Parliament. Rarely are they debated on the floor of Parliament. But even when the, the Parliament debates, Parliament has been told that they are mere advisory. Yet under the sep doctrine of separation of powers, you cannot tell Parliament that they are mere advisory. But in this country, Parliament has been told that whatever they decide on is advisory. Mm -hmm. So that's the nature of the crisis that we are dealing with in this country. Mm -hmm. the, the executive does whatever they want. Okay, so in terms of, you know, training and uh, ensuring that the civil society space that has remained uh, still gets empowered, what's the way forward? But how do you empower civil society? You know, we need to look at actions. Actions speak louder than words. It is easier for a government representative to look in the camera and say we have a vibrant civil society. But what are you doing to civil society? You're close, uh, attacking their, their organization offices. You're closing them down mm -hmm. without due process. You are closing the partners that support civil society, but also support government, like EU member countries. You're closing every space that exists for citizens to participate in their governance, also monitor and protect human rights. So how can you then look in the camera and say, we shall empower, we have this? No. Actions speak louder than words, and Ugandans should look at the actions of this government. Okay, um, Dr. Sewanyana, in the still in the same space, uh, even though the house is coming down, there's still a ventilator through which you can maneuver to be able to then extend the kind of work that you are doing in this country. Well, in terms of the space, even with it shrinking and shrinking by the day, Ugandans believe that there's something that you can do. And so moving forward, how do you and us protect ourselves? <coughs> One thing we need to be, to be very clear about is that it is the state's responsibility to uphold human rights. They have the primary duty. All other prayers are secondary. So that must always be borne in mind. It's important that the state upholds human rights in its entirety. In the reality, it's not. So. Now, of course, there are other players. The closure of this office, of course, deprives us of a critical player in terms of resources, expertise, and possibilities of technical assistance. So we would be losing that critical player. But at the local scene, it's also important that government rethinks its strategy. We can't exist without government approval. We, and it's important that they understand whether they still are committed. If you recall the 10-point program of the NRM, I think if it was point number one, it was about respect for human rights, democracy, and rule of law. The key question is, when you have a disempowered civil society, when there are no resources being extended to these human rights players, when the environment is not enabling, are you still committed to that? Yes, monitoring of human rights violations will continue. We shall still continue to engage with the UN system. Of course, it, whether this office is here or not, we still engage, can engage with this. But of course, that link, that direct link mm. will have been cut. Above it all, it requires a reorientation of the system. And we have argued over and over that with the resurgence of human rights violations, we do not see a strong commitment of the state. There are institutions definitely which should do the work. Recently, the Minister of Justice announced that there is going, there is going to be, and I think they have already instituted, a cabinet subcommittee or a cabinet committee on human rights. Now, all these myriad actors should be empowered, should be strengthened, should be given the environment that enables them to achieve that goal. When that is done, then maybe you could argue that, yes, we are in a state of affairs where we can do our business. 
But human rights promotion and protection is first and foremost the primary responsibility of the state, but also it requires cooperation within local actors, within state actors, and the international community. So when this office is kicked out, that doesn't show cooperation with the international system. When the organizations which Billet is talking about are disempowered, that doesn't show solidarity and a deliberate intention to uphold human rights. So it will require to rethink the whole system. It will require us to reorient. It will require government to come out clearly and demonstrate to the Ugandan citizen. Because the human rights we are talking about is not necessarily about us. It's about the Ugandan citizen. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about rights, it's also important to look at them within their broader context. That are people able to feed themselves? Are people able to take their children to school? Are people able to, ac uh, to acquire decent yeah. housing? Mm -hmm. Are people able to get, jo are able to get jobs? Mm -hmm. And are they able to access justice? Mm -hmm. In that totality, then we would say, we have arrived. Until that becomes a reality for us in Uganda, then we have not yet arrived. That's where we stand right now on this matter. And of course, with the experts that have shared their wealth of knowledge in regards to the repercussions of this one act by the state, uh, there must be willingness of the state to have such offices in a country. If it's not there, then that is what we're facing with moving forward.